Okay, welcome everyone. So today, what uh, I will uh, I will talk about is uh, a little bit more about constraint qualifications, and then a little bit, and then we will move on to the theory of duality for convex optimization. Now, you may you will recall that we had I had to told you about what is uh, in an abstract sense what is called a constraint qualification. So, a constraint. constraint qualification if you recall i had i had mentioned that we say that a constraint qualification holds if the tangent if uh, the tangent cone can be described in terms of the constraint in terms of the gradients of the constraint so let's say suppose um, so so, to describe this properly, let me let us first let us take let let S be the set G i of x less than equal to 0 for all i from 1 to m. If you remember A of x star was what we call the active set it is those i in 1 to m such that g i of at x star is equal to 0 and we say that a, we said that we say that a constraint qualification holds if the tangent cone with respect to the set S evaluated at x star is equal to the set of D such that. So, these G i s remember are functions from R n to R. So, S itself is a subset of R n. So, we say that the, the we say that the constraint qualification holds if the tangent cone can be written in this it can be expressed in this sort of form. It is all these such that the gradient of g uh, g i transpose d is less than equal to 0 for all i belonging to the active set. Right. So, if so we had uh, we if if this holds then we say that the uh, that a constraint qualification holds. Now, we do not we we I, I also alluded to you that one uh, one way by which one uh, condition that ensures that these this holds right the one condition that ensures that this holds was what was called the uh, was the linear independence condition. So, it said that if if these gradients so the the linear independence linear independence constraint qualification was one such constraint qualification linear independence constraint qualification was it simply said that all these gradients the gradients at star these are linearly independent. Now, if these are linearly independent, then some, uh, then that guaranteed uh, as equality in this in this relation. So then, essentially, we could characterize the tangent cone as as given by uh, by this particular set of inequalities. Now, what we will uh, what I'll mention to you now are some uh, some more constraint qualifications. So some of these have names some of these are are um, have been uh, just referred to in the literature by uh, kind of directly so so here's here's one constraint qualification uh, 
ok. So, suppose suppose we are referring to some x star in S and suppose So, we are uh, uh, I am here in this in the in these constraint qualifications I am going to be referring to S in this sort of form ok in the form that it is all those x such that g i of x is less than equal to 0. So, this this gives us constraint qualifications for sets that are described completely by inequality constraints, but then you can always extend it directly to those which have equality constraints by posing the equality as two opposing inequalities ok. So, uh, suppose x star in, in uh, suppose x star is, is in S and suppose there exists and suppose there exists an h star in R n such that for each i in the active set we either have either gradient of i of of gradient of g i transpose d is less than 0 strictly less than 0 or gradient of g evaluate g i at evaluated at x star transpose d is equal to 0 and g i um, do not need the bracket here and g i is affine ok. Then, then we can then, then the constraint qualification is satisfied constraint qualification holds. So, in short this here what I have written here is a you can say is a sufficient condition for the for a constraint qualification to hold. So, this Okay. sufficient condition for C q to hold. Now, you can be you can make this. Uh, so, what does this say? This says that uh, oh my uh, my mistake here I should not say I should let me raise this my mistake here in the notation I instead of it star let me write d let me write d so if you can find a d a, a direction d such that for every constraint you the uh, in that direction you are if you move in that direction if for every constraint that is active and from that if you move in that direction a, for each constraint you you become strictly feasible or you remain on the constraint, but then the constraint is affine ok. In that case in that in that case we say that uh, the uh, the uh, then from there it follow it it would follow that there is equality uh, there is equality here that that the constraint qualification holds right ok. Now, there is a uh, somewhat uh, somewhat uh, longish proof for uh, there is a somewhat longish proof for this. I am going to skip the proof. If if you want to look up the proof, you can uh, look up the notes of Praveen Varaya on the on the internet. So here is another here is another uh, constraint qualification. Actually, this con this one is very popular. It uh, it's a very popular constraint qualification and it is it comes out as a weakening of of c q 1 right. So, let me let me mention this to you. So, okay, once again suppose sorry, I should be more clearer here c q then the c q holds at x star ok. Suppose x star is in S and suppose there exists a direction d um, oh sorry I do not need the direction d here um, my mistake.
suppose x star is in S ok and suppose there exists an x hat ok in R n such that the following following is uh, following holds such that for each i in the active set a of x r e either g i of x star is strictly less than 0 and g i of g i is and g i is is convex ok. So, this for us are all and also in C 1 ok. I did not mention it, but these great these functions are all uh, uh, differentiable functions otherwise I would not be able to take derivatives here yeah. So, these are uh, so this is strictly less than 0 and g i is a convex function or g i of x star sorry this is not x star sorry this is x hat my mistake today so, and g i of x, star, x hat is less than equal to 0 and g i is affine ok. So, suppose you can find a point x x hat here a point x hat like this an x hat in R n such that for each each uh, constraint in the active set either the constraint holds with uh, constraint holds strictly at x hat ok. Either the constraint holds strictly at x hat and the constraint the function the constraint itself is a convex constraint or the constraint just simply holds its g i of x hat less than equal to 0 and the constraint is affine ok. In other words for affine constraints all you are asking for is feasibility and for uh, convex constraints you are asking for strict feasibility ok. For convex constraints you are asking for strict feasibility ok. So, so naturally an affine constraint is also convex constraint. So, uh, so, so, so those that are uh, so, this this one is to be applied uh, can be applied only to those constraints that are non affine and yet convex ok. So, for this uh, you have you uh, what we are asking for is strictly feasible. So, this sort of point this point x hat is what is called a Slater point and I will make a mention of it again it comes up uh, in a very important way later also it is what is called a Slater point. So, so x hat is what is called a Slater point ok uh, and this condition itself is sometimes referred to as the Slater condition ok that there exists such a uh, such a point. Now, there, are, there is a weaker version of this where you do not where you do not ask for uh, f the, the trouble with the, the way this way of writing constraint qualifications is that it asks us to check this for every i in the active set a much easier thing to do is not bother about the active set and at all and to and to check that this holds for all i ok. That and so, uh, sometimes when we refer to a Slater point we refer to that uh, to this to a point where this holds these hold not just for i in the in a in a certain active set, but rather for all i. So, that there is, so essentially what it refers to is that your uh, the uh, the existence of a in that case what uh, what this is referring to is that your uh, the feasible region s is such that uh, there is a there is a point that is in the interior of all the convex constraints and is feasible for all the affine constraints so these these points here which satisfy the convex constraints with strictly this point here uh, where all the const convex constraints are satisfied strictly 
that sort of point is in the interior of the, all the convex constraints and this ensures that it, it satisfies all the affine constraints. So, this put these two put together is effectively saying that you have a what is a point that is in the strict uh, strictly in the interior of the convex constraints and satisfying the affine constraint. Now, why does this have what does this have to do with uh, the constraint qualification? Well, uh, you can actually check once uh, I will just mention a hint here. The hint is to check try um, hint is uh, try d equal to um, x hat minus x star in constraint qualification 1. Okay, in constraint qualification 1, you try out d as x hat minus x star, use the fact that g is, g is convex and g is differentiable etcetera and that should bring you back to something like this, right. Okay, so, the, I would not say more than that. Okay, I did not complete my sentence here, so let me complete do that. Okay, so, with these constraint qualifications done, we will now move on to the study of duality in, in convex optimization. Okay. So, here is my optimization problem. So, so minimize f of minimize f of x subject to g i of x less than equal to 0 and for all i equal to 1 to m and although we are talking of convex optimization, let me just write this out first for the moment in a little bit in a in a general sort of way. So, with h j of x equal to 0. So, in a convex optimization problem obviously, these would be linear, but let this issue come up when when we actually need when we actually need it. Now, if you recall we I had defined this uh, this function called the Lagrangian function. So, I had defined it as this summation lambda i g i of x i going from 1 to m plus summation theta j h j of x j going from 1 to p right. Okay. So, this uh, this is what so this is this was what was called the Lagrangian function. And then now now let me define the following other function. This function is all this function is d which is a function of just lambda and theta. This d is simply the infimum of the Lagrangian over the entire space infimum over x for a function for a fix lambda in theta over the entire space. Now, this function is what is called there is a name for this this is called a dual function. Now, there is a reason why it is called a dual function because you will soon see that it is actually related in very in a very close way to duality itself. So, the uh, the problem of uh, uh, the dual problem and so on comes up comes up exactly from there. Now, before we uh, before I uh, before we actually go, uh, go a little deeper into this. So, do you uh, is there something that can be noticed directly first? So, here are a couple of things that 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 need to that you you should note. Okay. First is that d b. So, d is a function which is a point wise minimum of linear functions. What does that mean? So, if you look at the if you uh, if you look at uh, uh, the Lagrangian as a function of 
if you look at the Lagrangian function as a function of just lambda and theta, then it is actually linear in lambda and theta. And what you are doing in this definition here is taking the minimum of this sort of linear function over a, diff a third variable x. So, you are take you have actually uh, if you look at this as as functions of lambda and theta, you have in fact a family of function linear functions of lambda and theta and what you are doing is taking for each lambda and theta the least of those. Now, what hap what sort of a function would result from this? A pointwise infimum of, of linear functions would end up becoming actually a, so that actually becomes necessarily a concave function. Okay. So, so this is something you can prove for yourself that d is a concave function. It is a concave function of lambda and theta. And now, this, this fact does not require this does not require f g etcetera f g h to be convex. So, the problem does not need to be a convex optimization. Uh, um, uh, this the fact that this is that d d is always a concave function is um, uh, holds uh, holds for any optimization problem like this. Okay. So, as a consequence what what we can say is if I suppose I pose this following other other type of problem which is suppose I say look at this problem where I am looking to maximize with subject to lambda greater than equal to 0 and all theta the function d of lambda comma theta. This sort of a problem is therefore, is a convex optimization problem. This sort of problem is always is a convex optimization problem and why is that the case? The reason for that is because the, the its objective is, is concave and you are maximizing the objective. So, effectively it is equivalent to minimizing the negative of d. So, if you are minimizing the negative of d that would be a convex minimizing a convex function over a convex feasible region which is just lambda greater than equal to 0 and theta theta unconstrained or in short theta in R p right. So, this is always a convex optimization problem. This problem is what we is let me give it a name it is what is called a dual problem. And you will soon see that this is in fact nothing but the dual problem that you have encountered the same as the dual problem that you have encountered as part of your study in linear program all right ok. So, well if this is supposed to be the dual problem then what what where are the relations of of uh, of duality which is uh, strong duality and and uh, which is strong duality and weak duality. So, let us first look at weak duality, strong duality is where the uh, is where is where we will spend most of our time uh, uh, subsequently. So, where